This is an interview with Roger Gill for the Oral History Project of the East Ham Historical Society, and it's taking place in Roger's living room on Appleseed Road in East Ham. The date is June 14th, 2023, and the interviewers are Rick Lindholm and myself, Marka Daly. And full disclosure, Roger and I are first cousins and grew up next to each other. So I'll try my best not to interrupt him too often. <laughs> Rick. Okay, we might as well uh, start. When were you born and where were you born? Uh, I was born in March of 1945 at Cape Cod Hospital. Okay. Um, what did your, your parents live in East Ham? Yes, we lived in East Ham. We, they were living at the uh, Swift House at the time. Uh, Dad was working for Hermie Dill across the street at the garage, and Mom did uh, alterations and sign painting and a lot of other stuff to make a little extra money, and she uh, passed on a lot of those things to me. We, well, okay, we all know the uh, Swift House is a museum. How did your, how did your family get in that house? Uh, my grandmother and grandfather, Ray and Verena Daly, bought the place, uh, not sure the exact year, it was probably... 1939. 30, 39, yeah. Back <laughs> Sorry. Then, it was late, late, that's right, late 30s. Um, they bought the whole, half the, or about half the center of East Ham, this whole property where my house is now, and uh, all around the pond. They had two sand pits there that uh, Grandpa used to sell sand out of. Uh, and he had a large farm he had rabbits and pigs and uh, goats and well, chickens, uh, which he slaughtered all of them to eat. He, they, they used them for food. It was uh, it was a great experience as a kid growing up on the farm. Where was the sand pits? Uh, there, well, one was right right here where my house is, and one was out behind where Marcus' house is. The the big one was over here. There was a large hill here that they uh, when they developed the land, they knocked it down and leveled everything off. Uh, that was called the Big Sand Pit, and the, the little one was uh, see out by where Marcus' house is now, behind there. Yeah, yeah. Let's see, uh, what did your parents do in town? I uh, said, so Dad, Dad worked for Hermie Dill at the garage. At the he was garage. a mechanic over there, yeah. Um, and your mother did and mother, sign painting and stuff? Mother did sign painting and alterations on clothes, and uh, she taught me how to sew, actually. Uh, I learned a lot about sewing from Mother. Uh, well, the story when I was in uh, high school, we uh, I was going out with one of the cheerleaders, and they, they were making uniforms for the cheerleaders. And I happened to go in after the home ec department after school, and this my friend at the time, she was having trouble putting in a zipper, and I sat down and in about three minutes I showed her how to put the zipper in, and she went to Mrs. Collins, uh, Betty Collins, I think it was, the home ec teacher, and said, Roger just showed me how to put the zipper in. Is this right? <laughs> she said, if Roger told you how to do it, his mother probably taught him, and it's right. <laughs> uh, Mom also, they, she did a lot of uh, work for the, the church. She and Grandma Daly both uh, did a lot of volunteer work at the church. They, I was involved in a lot of that with them. It was around 1957 or 8, uh, Father went to work for McQuaid Motors in Orleans. That's where we started the our own garage there eventually. What about your brothers and sisters? Yeah, my brothers and sisters, we were all uh, like five or six years apart and we really didn't have a lot to do. I changed all the diapers, I can tell you that. <laughs> um, but we didn't do a lot of stuff together when we were younger. I think we're a lot closer now than we were <clears throat> when we were younger because of the, the age difference. We had, you know, different um, interests in different groups of people we were hanging around with. Uh, but we're all still here in town, uh, and everybody would get together frequently. I, my brother Randy, we work together at the garage in Orleans now. And Judy? And Judy, yeah. Uh, Judy lives up in the woods of Brewster. She has a, a farm up there. Uh, and my sister Pam, she's a retired nurse, and she and her husband are, live in East Ham. They have Mother's old house down by Cook's Brook that they're renovating for guests. Interested um, where where in Cooks Brook? It's down at the well. It's it's, it's called uh, it's Steel Road now. They changed the name. It used to be Cooks Brook Road, yeah, yeah. and they they changed the road. 
Uh, Cook's Brook used to come down around and down a little hill and then out to the beach and Steel Road met it there, but they changed it all to Steel Road now. Oh, down that, down that hill. Right, yeah. and she's, uh, there are about four or five houses from the beach on the uh, left-hand side headed towards the beach. It's an old cottage that uh, my grandfather, uh, my mother's father built. He built that and, um, what do you have, five, four or five other cottages. Huh. I think there were four of us that he built. And, but he had a couple of us down there that he bought that were already built. Uh, and they, as they got old and retired, they sold, they used to rent them in the summer. That was a, one of the big uh, <clears throat> things in my life, to making Saturday morning trips to the cottages with Grandpa Ray. Uh, we would uh, go down and clean out the outhouses. They didn't have indoor plumbing in those days, even, say, back in the... 50s, uh, they were just starting to get Shut into a plumber, and they had a, an old hand pump in the sink in an outhouse outside. We used to, I used to go to Grandpa Ray, and we'd clean out the outhouses and you know, replace the leathers in the in the pump in the sink, and we'd take the garbage to the dump. And going to the dump with Grandpa Ray, it was he, he'd bring home more than he than he took usually. He he was uh, good friends with. Uh, Tony, I mean, uh, it was Manny, Manny and Charlie Escobar. Manny was the dad and Charlie was his son. They were the dump keepers. And Grandpa Ray was on their good side, so he used, they used to let him pick, take, have his uh, pick of things at the dump, and he would bring home his trailer with a lot more than he took many a days. And one of the, the younger, whoever the younger one, I, I'm pretty sure it was Tony was the, was the younger one. He, he had a, a pilot's license. He flew airplanes out of the... Uh, uh, East Ham Airport. Do you remember that? Yes, I do. My, my father used to, we used to go for plane rides and from the East Ham Airport with him. And when they closed that, he moved up to Sky Meadow. We went in Orleans and we went out of there a few times. Do you see, it seems like every town had its own airport. People used to fly. Uh, it just seems like we had a, a lot more in yeah, the way. The, the, airport, the airport was a pretty, pretty going operation. Uh, it was also, uh, later in life, we, as kids, we used to, a couple of the guys had cars there. Whoever owned it, I don't know who owned it at the time, but yeah. they would let the Jim Henry Nickerson and uh, Dickie Nickerson had old cars there. We'd go there and drive, before, this before we had licenses, of course, and we uh, would go and drive the cars around the airport. I also had a, a racetrack out here behind the house. So I always had an old car. My father would have some old junker from the garage that he couldn't sell. And he'd, we'd put it out in the fields and I would drive it around and take kids for rides out there. And I see you, uh, you went in the military? Was that right, yes. right after high school? No, I was uh, a couple of, couple of three years after high school. I, uh, I didn't sign up for the draft. I wasn't... Uh, wasn't that I was a draft dodger, I wasn't a post or anything, I just didn't bother to sign up. And one day I got a letter, a couple of years after I turned 18, uh, I got a letter saying that I hadn't signed up for the draft and would be, I better go to the town hall and do it. So I did it and about two months later I got my draft notice. Uh, it, was, uh, it was a great experience. The military was great for me. It, uh, I stayed in for a total of 28 years. Uh, when I got drafted, I went to Fort Lewis, Washington. We were part of a big experiment that the Army was doing at the time. They were, it was with the uh, 4th Infantry Division, and they were, they were going to rotate whole divisions in and out of Vietnam. Uh, this plan that they thought looked good on paper, but it, in actuality it didn't work very well because they forgot that guys get killed and guys get reassigned and guys get sick, and by the time of a division's year was there, they only had about half the original people, and uh, they decided this rotation thing wasn't very good. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> so the fourth division is where I started out at Fort Lewis, Washington. I spent a uh, little over a year there, and then I went to Officers Candidate School at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. I didn't go to Vietnam with the guys from the fourth division. I, I stayed very close to all those guys, so it was the first unit I was with, and we had a very close-knit, uh, well-trained unit. Yeah. Um, and then I say from OCS, I went to Fort Hood, Texas for two years. I, they didn't send me right to Vietnam. I was got lucky once again. Um, 
And I spent two years at Fort Hood. By the time I got to Vietnam, I was a captain. And I uh, very, had a great job there. I worked in a, at the first Field Force headquarters. I landed there about 6 o'clock in the morning, and I, we landed at the airport. And they were waiting for a bus to take uh, all the guys to the headquarters. And this Special Forces Master Sergeant that I made friends with on the plane over with said, Hey, Captain, he said, I got a uh, Jeep coming to get me up. I'll give you a ride to the headquarters. And he gave me a ride over there. I was the first one that signed in. I reported into the G1. And he says, I've got three jobs available. One's in an air-conditioned building out back. Do you want to hear about the other two? I said, no, sir. <laughs> <laughs> and I spent my year right there. It was great. Uh, I was very lucky. Then I came back. I went back to Fort Sill for a couple of years. I, uh, I had finished my college there at Fort Sill. The Army had a program at the time where the, it was called the bootstrap program. And if you had so many college credits, they would give you full pay and allowances and you went to school full time as a, <clears throat> as a student. And I did that for nine months and finished up my college degree there. And when I got, I got out of the Army in uh, 73, they had a reduction in force and they had too many captains and lieutenants and they shipped us all home. And I, Stayed in the National Guard and the Reserves for another 20 years and retired in 1993. What, what did you uh, get your degree in? Um, I got <clears throat> my degree it was in uh, general education and uh, I, my bachelor's degree. Uh, yeah. And then uh, I went to, uh, I was going to graduate school at night for an MBA. Uh, at the University of Oklahoma nights and weekends they had a program at Fort Sill and I got um, sent home but I was like two or three courses short of finishing my, my MBA I never did get to finish that I was planning on maybe they had courses um, the closest one was in Washington you could go to weekends but I just went to work at the garage and didn't really need any more education <laughs> yeah, yeah. you must have had some mechanical skills yeah, I, um, I'm not really mechanical. I've learned most of it by doing it and just through experience. Uh, uh, my mother taught me a, on a lot of my mechanics when I was a young kid, uh, working on my bicycle. Uh, I had a big paper route and I depended on my bicycle for transportation. Uh, and mother showed me how to oil the chain and replace the chain and tighten the chain and repack the grease and the wheel barons. Uh, she was very, very good with all kinds of mechanical and building stuff. Uh, Where was your uh, paper route? My paper route, I covered the whole town of East Ham. I, uh, I took it over from Jay Brackett. Jay had the paper route before I did. Who was Jay and Brackett before you was, wanted? That was Bell Brackett's son. Bell who was the town accountant. Yeah. And Jay, uh, he went on to be a, a musician. He was a, a jazz musician, trombone player. He lived down in New Orleans after he left here. Um, he died fairly young, I think. But anyhow, the, the paper went from the Dairy Queen in New Orleans to the drive-in. Wow. I, I think I delivered papers to your, your mother. Uh, What's that? I think I delivered papers to your house when yeah. you, you were kids. Yeah, I think yeah. I did. Uh, I did. I did the paper for two years. I say, I, it, the. My father's uh, south customer was uh, Dick Adams uh, and uh, Rudy Westman lived in that house. It was an old red house behind the, uh, the, behind the Dairy Queen, uh, next, just past Collins. Uh, and I say I went all the way down to the, uh, the Handel's house oh, yeah. in uh, Northeast Ham and uh, I covered from the, from the bay to the ocean. Uh, it used to take me two and a half to three hours every day. Uh, wow. Sundays, Sundays were a little, little uh, easier because not everyone took the Sunday paper. Sundays were about half the, half the route. It was still the same distance, but about half the stops on Sundays. But Ask the, him if he ever missed a day. Did, yeah, yeah, did you ever miss a day? No, I didn't. Uh, <laughs> my, my mother would drive me if it was really rainy. She, she didn't Wanna when she encouraged me to go out in the bad weather and do what I had to do because it was my job. Uh, <laughs> but if it was really pouring hard, mother would drive me. It, uh, what about the winter? Yeah, the winter I just yeah. I rode through the snow and yeah. Wow. It, uh, 
I, I put a lot of miles on my bicycles in those days. <laughs> and I, I learned a lot about business uh, with the paper route. Uh, Buddy Chase at the Hillside Grill was one of my customers, and, and Buddy was notorious for not paying me. And he every once in about once a month he'd come, oh here boy, have a couple of hamburgers and a, and a coke and, a, and an ice cream sundae, and we'll just take it off the bill. <laughs> Buddy Buddy taught me about bartering. Yeah, <laughs> he was a great guy. I learned a lot from him about finances. <laughs> and I just I delivered paper all the the, the selectmen. Uh, and people that worked at the town hall, I used to like to go to the town hall just to visit them when I was younger. I, I think they, they tried to shoo me out most of the time, but I just stopped to visit the people because I, I knew who they were. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, who was the police department at that time? I think Winnie Knowles was the, was the police department. Uh, he, uh, and when I first thought, he was probably the only one. Yeah. They, and they would just work during the daytime. They were just on call at night. Was Wynn uh, Deschamps your age? Uh, yeah, Wynn's a couple. He was a couple of years younger than I am. Okay. His uh, dad, his dad Bob, was was a yeah, part-time uh, special police. He would he was on duty sometimes nights and weekends. Uh, he and Jerry Jerry Emmons who became the police chief. He was he was on there part-time. And uh, Kenny Higgins, Kenny Higgins was uh, he was a part-time. I'll tell you my story about Kenny one time. Kenny and it was Kenny and Bob Deshaun, I think. We a friend of mine had rented a house down by uh Nosset Light, the Three Blinks Cottage, and we we used to have parties down there pretty frequently, like probably daily. Uh, <laughs> and they they came down one time to for a noise complaint and we were up on the roof of the house and uh they came along and they told us, now you guys, you know, we got a noise complaint. Uh, you guys got to come down off of there. And we said, well, why don't you come up and get us? Yeah. <laughs> we were just being smart ass young kids. Probably, probably alcohol had a lot to do with our reactions. Yeah. Uh, but Bob and, and Kenny said, okay, well, you know, we're going to take off. You guys just quiet down. And you know, it was back in the days. And, and we did. You know, they left and we came down and we, we quieted down and continued on with the party at a uh, lower level. Uh, it, but in those days, you know, we respected the police and, and they respected us. And it was, uh, it was just, you know, it was a, a good relationship. And, and we all, everybody knew who, <clears throat> who each other was and what they were going to do. And, you know, that the, the right thing would happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you remember the uh, the whistle? The f oh yeah, the noon time, the noon the noon whistle. How big was that? It was a huge tank. Remember that? Yeah, right. It was at the time. It would go off every day at noon time. They noon would time, test it. Yeah, you could tell it was noon time. It wasn't there a uh, sequence for a code. There was a code. code we had hanging on the wall in the kitchen. Yeah. For the, where the uh, each road or each section of town had a code, and it was. Uh, I think it was Frank Fuller. Frank Fuller, he maintained that whistle, I think. He was a volunteer mm -hmm. fireman. And I think his oil company um, put out the, the little poster each year. That had a, had a, I think it had a calendar and it had all the, the call signs yeah. or the, the whistle blasts on it. Yeah. I'll put a picture of that because I yeah. still have mine. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Good. 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 Yeah. I'll put it on the video. Yeah. <laughs> okay. How about uh, telephones? Yeah, I, my number was 178W3. You were uh, 178W1. And Mark was, and Mark really? was W1, yeah. And the, the other, was M3. Grammy was M3. Uh, and the, the other, there were four people on the party line. The, the fourth person was, was a summer person. They weren't here very often. But the other people, when, when uh, if you picked up the phone and was busy, you could just listen in to the, the other people on the line. Eight uh, party lines. Yeah, right. Uh, and they still had uh, the I can remember they still having the operators. The operator was in Orleans. Uh, Didn't uh, Paul Humphrey's mother do that? She might have. Oh, There's, she might have. They donated yeah. a switchboard to the historical society. I don't know where where they kept it. Yeah, yeah, in Orleans. I had a uh, my uh, great uncle uh, worked there. He was he was the mail operator in Orleans at night. Oh, as you uh, just Grandpa before Freddy's? Jolly Jacks, yeah. Your Grammy Allison's. Grammy Allison's. Uh, just before Jolly Jacks. Yeah. Right there. Is that where it was? No, it was downtown yeah. where the where the uh, 
they have a little park there now next to uh, next to the bank, the TD Bank. That building there, that the, I think the town owns it now, and they do different oh, things there. Yeah, but the the original telephone uh, office was in there where the switchboard was. Okay. Hollis Eldridge. Hollis Eldridge was the he was the, the nighttime operator there. Yeah. We would sort of we, we'd call them. We'd just talk to the operators sometimes. <laughs> and, and the operators, they they always knew what was going on in town because they they would listen into all the calls and they they had all the the latest information. I, I there were two or three women that worked there. Uh, I can't remember any of their names now, but they they always knew all the, all the gossip and what was going on. You had to be careful what you said on the phone, kind of, kind of like today. I mean, you, you talk in your house and then your computer comes up with, you, with the thing you're talking about. But, uh. You know what I noticed, in, at least in the Orleans area, there's a lot of businessmen that were all about your age. Don't you think uh, a lot of the guys, uh, who am I thinking of, like Paul, yeah, uh, Paul Daniels, Daniels yeah. and then Bob that uh. used to have the grain store. Yeah, Bob Gill. 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 Yeah, no relation. But, uh, no. Yeah, and Billy Darrell. Well, a lot of a uh, lot of the guys. Uh, I would say about half and half. Half of them. It was about. It was a family business before they they got it. Oh, okay. And uh, a lot of the guys started out on their own, like like Bob and Paul. Uh, and uh, well, Paul Burton. Paul Burton used to have a oh, yeah. septic pumping business. He started out. A lot of the guys were just regular guys from in high school, uh, and they. Uh, they worked hard and went out and, and got out on their own and, and made a good business out of nothing. Crosby Fence. Yeah, yeah. He was like the only fence yeah. guy around there for a while. Barry, Barry Quinn, of course, Barry's an old East Ham boy from the... Yeah. yeah. He lived right through the yeah. woods here. Um, he's got a very successful business in all means. Uh, well, so John Martin, John, his, his dad Dave started that business. Um, I was just one of them. Uh, we found some stuff in my mother's paperwork when she passed away. There was a picture of the old McQuaid Motors building, an advertisement, and Father and Phil Deshawn were. Father was the uh, service manager, and Phil was the sales manager. Uh, uh, both they went on to run their own businesses and be very successful. Yeah. Talk, talk a little about taking the, the scouts or the woodies or whatever out on the outer beach, what it used to be like. Oh the yeah, the beach. the beach was uh, a big part of our lives, especially when we were young. Uh, we started out with the uh, Model A's. Dad always had a Model A with big tires. Um, and we'd drive down to Coast Guard and sometimes if the tide was real low, you could drive all the way to Pamet and Truro on the outside of the beach there. We'd, we'd pick up firewood, you know, driftwood for, and take it home and cut it up for the for the fireplace. Uh, lots of times we'd gather sea clams out there. Uh, as, and we, when I was older, we used to go down, a friend of mine that worked at the garage with me, we had two four-wheel drive vehicles and two or three nights a week after work, we'd go on at Coast Guard and drive down <clears throat> into, to Wellfleet and just pick up driftwood. We usually had a, a quart of brandy with us. Okay. And lots of times we'd get the we get that vehicles loaded up with stuff. Didn't know how we got the stuff on. It was a little big and a little heavy, but we got it home and unloaded it and got it cut up eventually. Uh, also, when I first got back to the Cape, when I got out of the army, uh, I had an old jeep, and we and we take the the kids would we'd go down to the beach. We'd spend the night down there. We'd go out and dig a bucket of clams and build a gather wood, build a fire, and cook the clams and camp out on the beach. Uh, the uh, it was a shame when they, they closed that the the, uh, the beach was just eroding but they, they could have used it a couple more years I was on one of the study committees for the beach and they wanted to close it instantly and I tried to tell them to you know keep it open let people use it and enjoy it as long as we can because it's not going to be here forever and that was around seventy six I think it was and they they town ended up closing the the beach at the time. Uh, and then 78 it was just wiped out with a, a big blizzard. And we, we um, and then we started going to Orleans, we'd start, we'd use the Orleans Beach. It was, uh, but that's become so crowded today, they, they close it for, 
piping plovers and then the, there's so many people there you got to get out there at seven o'clock in the morning to, to get a spot it's did you uh, it, uh, ever surf no fish? I didn't surf. I, I, I surfed once uh, no surf fish I mean. oh surf fish no I didn't no. do I'm not a big fisherman I never yeah. I my fishing uh, was probably limited to muddy pond I did a lot of fishing when I was young we used to <laughs> Uh, fish on Muddy Pond. My mother built me a, an eight-foot pram and dad gave me a uh, one-and-a-half horsepower Elgin outboard. It was made by Sears, Sears and Roebuck. Uh, he took it as part of a trade on a car one that he sold one day. He used, to, he used to sell cars in the front yard to make a little extra money. He always had two or three cars there for sale. Do I remember a paddle boat? Yeah, those yeah. were from, from the end of May's Cottages. Wow. Uh, okay. They had two of them tied up at the, they had a dock across the pond, and Mr. Vandermeer would, would let us use them. Um, we used them, if, as long as his co cottage customers weren't there, or weren't using them, we, he'd let the kids use them. He also let us, he had a big game room up there with a, a shuffleboard and uh, I think a ping pong table. Uh, and we could, he'd let us go in and use the, the game room. He was a great guy. Uh, he, would let all the kids in the neighborhood use all those facilities. There was a lot there. of cottages in there. Wasn't yeah, it? yeah. I think your dad built those, didn't he? He did. Yeah. And wow. We yeah. worked our yeah. way yeah. through junior high yeah. uh, babysitting for the people who stayed there. Yeah, right. <laughs> Vandeme mm. always called yeah. the yeah. babysitters. <laughs> yeah, and we used to, my sister Judy and I used to catch turtles in the pond, and we'd, we'd sell them for a quarter apiece in the front yard. We had a pretty good business going selling turtles for a few years. <laughs> and my, uh, my Uncle Warren, he was a great fisherman. He lived with my grandmother and grandfather, um, and he made his own fishing lures to catch pickerel with. They were, they were made out of wood. He, he um, carved them and then painted them and put hooks in them. And he was quite a quite a fisherman. He 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 showed me how to fish and taught me how to catch. Was this a gill? No, a daily. Oh, daily. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I used to use the the red and white daredevils to oh, catch yeah. pickerel yeah. with. I yeah. found they were the best. <laughs> what about ice fishing? Uh, you ever do any of that? No, I don't think we ever do. I, we did a lot of skating on the pond. We had, uh, yeah. it could, in those in those days, the pond would freeze over every winter for most of the winter and. Uh, when I first built the house here, we still had frozen, uh, would still freeze open. I had big spotlights put on the back of the house to light up the pond, so we, we had skating parties at night out there. But lately, the pond hasn't frozen oh, no. good enough to skate on. It, uh, Remember checkerboard? Yeah, checkerboard pond. At the end yeah. of uh, it the was great had pond. the had the. Uh, I think that had something to do with the rail railroad, didn't it? The, the checkerboard. Is that the one we call Aunt Jemima's? Aunt Jemima's. Yeah, Aunt Jemima's. Yeah. Yeah. They had a big board. Yeah. With, it was like a, checkerboard. like a checkerboard, and yeah. The, and, and the, the firemen sign. put floodlights up. Yeah, the right. The firemen, the firemen put lights up down but there. But why did they have the checkerboard, I wonder? Must have been because that's where the depot was. Yeah, I think, I, I'm i not sure, but I think it had something to do with the, the train depot. Yeah, it could. I'll check in the archives. Yeah, so. right. <laughs> good, good research project. Yep. <laughs> yeah, we used to skate there yeah. quite a bit. Yeah. And the train, I remember the train, I remember the train coming through town. Uh, we used to go down by uh, Samoset Road there where the train came through where the bike trail is now. We'd, we'd put pennies on the track and, and so they would flatten the pennies out. We'd try to find them afterwards and gather them. We thought weren't we had you, quite a treasure. Weren't you afraid the train would uh, derail? No, 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 we didn't think about that. And, uh, a lot of the guys used to hop on the hop the train to, to Orleans. I never did it personally. Um, but towards the end, there were only just the conduct, uh, the, the engineer and one conductor on the train. There, was, there were no, no passengers. It was all just uh, freight. And there were just two people, so was, they would have to slow down for the, the crossing there at Samoset Road. And guys would, would jump out of the bushes, they'd hide in the, on the, over the bank and by the pond, and jump up and jump on the train, because you know, they didn't have like rear view mirrors or anything, I guess. And, <laughs> and the guy, the, I remember guys telling me, and I would see them do it, but I was, I was kind of scared. I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think I was more afraid of getting caught than anything else. <laughs> I 
going to take a break right yeah. now, and we'll recharge our memories for a moment before we continue. <laughs> <laughs>